Hello, welcome to the afternoon programming at Permissionless. We are on the institutional stage. Very excited for the next panel. It is called, Do We Still Need to Worry About Macro? Probably. Um, I will hand it off to our moderator, Jack Farley, who is the host of the Forward Guidance Podcast at BlockWorks. Well, uh, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. We've got a stacked panel right here. Uh, you're in Timur of uh, Fidelity, Jim Bianco, everyone knows him, Bianco Research, and uh, Mark Yusko of Morgan Creek Capital. The topic we're going to talk about today is macro. So let's just, for, I'll just define that. That's interest rates, traditional uh, stocks, bonds, economy, policy of central banks, and how does that affect crypto prices? In 2020, we were quite certain uh, that it was nothing but a, a help and that all this money printing would just, you know, uh, you know, it, it, if, if crypto is denominated in, in fiat currency and the denominator is being printed away, uh, you know, market, market goes up. But now that, that narrative is uh, uh, under question. And so I guess the question I want to ask uh, the three of you to start is going forward, uh, we're recording today, I guess, what, September 12th, uh, over the next 6, 12, 18, 24 months, is macro... Uh, favorable for, for crypto? Well, is, it a, is it a boost to crypto? Is it a detriment, uh, something that crypto has to overcome? Or does it not matter? Are they, are they really not correlated at all? Yuri, let's start with you. Okay, well, nice to be here. And by the way, um, before I start, who here can tell that Jim Bianco is a cyclist? <laughs> there, you, there you go. He's a man after my own heart. Um, so first of all, macro obviously matters. Uh, we wouldn't be having a panel if we thought the answer was no. Um, as you point out, three years ago, the macro became super, super favorable. And my sense at the time was that it would remain that way, that we were kind of in this, heading into this period of permanent um, financial repression, negative, you know, forced negative real rates, et cetera. And of course, we've all been been proven wrong because the Fed uh, reversed course very, very quickly. And as quickly as the money supply ballooned well above trend, it has reversed back towards that trend. So the very favorable macro environment of a couple of years ago has reversed very, very quickly. And you know that led to, obviously, um, at least in part, to the crypto winter directly to Bitcoin. Because if Bitcoin is uh, is a is an aspirational store of value, then it thrives on negative real rates and money printing, and it does the opposite in the opposite scenario. But that loose money era that created the the meme frenzy and all that stuff obviously fed its way into other cryptos as well, and all of that has reversed. And uh, we were talking earlier that you know the fact that Bitcoin is still standing at 26k after all the shit that was thrown at it over the last year plus, I think is a, is a pretty good sign. But it does need better macro uh, for that adoption curve to reaccelerate because it has somewhat languished over the last uh, you know, six to 12 months. Thanks, Jim. All investment is choices. Um, you have competition, you've got the option to invest in crypto, you've got the option to invest in TradFi. And a year ago, Two years ago, as you was talking about with financial repression, your option was zero. Well, your option is not zero right now. Your option is 5.5%, and that's going to impact the attractiveness of things like staking yield and liquidity pool yields and stuff. If you can wind up in the TradFi world investing and getting 5.5% with no risk, and let's be clear here, if you buy a Treasury bill of 5.5% and the Treasury defaults you better own some guns and some cans of soup because everything else is going to be worthless then at that point. Um, so, yes, it is a bit of a headwind or because it, it is providing more competition. And notice I said interest rates. I didn't necessarily say the stock market. You know, yeah, the stock market, you could say, can provide competition, but stocks you know, are more, more um, on greed and fear. They can overdo it and underdo it. But when you're talking about the risk-free rate right now at 5.5%, that does change a lot of equations. It also changes a lot of equations in the TradFi world as well, too. Yeah, I mean, I wore my, you know, keep calm, we'll print more T-shirt for the, for the macro panel. And yeah, macro matters, but it depends what we're talking about, Jack. So 
you asked the question about Bitcoin, does, does macro matter to Bitcoin? And while I'll never argue with Urin because he's forgotten more about macro than I'll ever know, I'll just say that no, it, it doesn't in the sense that one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. It always will be forevermore. But we don't price Bitcoin in Bitcoin. We price Bitcoin in other things, other pieces of toilet paper. So if you happen to live in Turkey, there's never been a bear market in Bitcoin. Not ever, because the lira just went to shit. And if you live in Venezuela, there's never been a bear market in Bitcoin, because the boulevard went to double shit. And if you live in Argentina, now with you know, talks of, of uh, devaluation, you, then again, Bitcoin just goes up. Now, Bitcoin goes up and down in the US because, partly because of this, right? So in the 200, first 246 years of our republic, we printed $10 trillion. 246 years, $10 trillion. Then in 18 months, we printed $10 trillion. Come on, someone shudder a little bit when I use the T word. Y'all know what a trillion is, right? Y'all math majors, I'm gonna shut the doors, make you sit here with us for 31,710 years, which I promise would be most unpleasant to listen to me for that long. And you gotta spend a dollar every second. That's one trillion. So 10 trillion, we printed 10 trillion. So if you doubled the money supply, what should have happened to the dollar? Should have gone down in half, exactly. What should have happened to the price of Bitcoin? Should have doubled. That's exactly what happened. Well, but, but it, it didn't just double. Yes, it did. It was about 13,000 before. It's about 26,000 now. It perfectly doubled. But it's down in, in the last few months. No shit, Sherlock. Have you seen this thing called Bitcoin futures? You can go to the day the Bitcoin futures ETF was approved. The day was the peak of Bitcoin priced in US dollars. Why? Because just like gold. Anyone looked at gold since the pandemic? Gold should have doubled. Read Chris Wood, okay? Gold has been the perfect store of value for 5,000 years. It's a long time. But it's been flat, dead flat at 1,900 bucks. Why? Because it gets spoofed by artificially manipulated by JP Morgan. And they get fined every year a billion dollars. And they're like, yeah, well, we made 20. It's the cost of doing business. You keep finding us a billion and we'll make 20 and we'll be happy. And they'll keep the price flat. So they've artificially suppressed the price of Bitcoin over the past few months. Why? Well, because BlackRock wants to buy it really cheap. There was a great meme the other day. Please don't sell your Bitcoin to BlackRock. Please don't be that person. But that's what's happening. And everyone's like, oh, when's the ETF going to get approved? What's that going to do? It's going to get approved when JP Morgan and BlackRock decide it will be approved, just like GLD was held up for two and a half years until JP Morgan could get short enough gold. So all of this goes to my last point, which is the title of the panel is Macro Matter. I mean, she stole her thunder saying probably, yes, probably. But, but actually, in our world, no. Crypto, digital assets, whatever you want to call it, actually are uncorrelated with traditional assets for macro reasons. Stocks and bonds are highly correlated along with currencies and commodities because they derive their value from the same things. GDP growth, inflation, interest rates, um, and corporate profits. Those four things have nothing to do with Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, anything, nothing. Those things are driven by millennial adoption, okay? The tech itself, the regulatory environment, and changes in monetary supply. So there's a, a little bit of linkage there, but this idea that somehow stocks and bonds are the same, most of the garbage that passes as crypto has no equity value, no debt value, no claim on cash flows. It's literally dog shit coins that people trade back and forth. That is not a thing that has value in any way, shape, or form like a stock where I own a piece of a company that generates you know, profits from goods and services. So macro doesn't matter to all that stuff, but it matters. So your point uh, about 
macro not mattering and the timeline is really interesting because let's take wind the clock back a year. Uh, the interest rates were lower. The Fed's balance sheet was higher. Since then, the Fed has done quantitative tightening, so you're doing the opposite of printing money, and uh, raising interest rates steadily, 75, 75, 50, 25, 25, continuing to raise it through a, you know, a, a seismic a panic in the, in the banking system in, in March. And yet Bitcoin is actually higher now. So I'd yeah. say the, the price action over the past year uh, would indicate, I mean, you, you would think that Bitcoin would be a lot lower, and crypto prices in general would be a lot lower, given that the macro has continued to get even more unfavorable. And I would say, uh, Urian and Jim, the same is true about stocks. I mean, I have been very surprised by this year's uh, rally in the equity market. I mean, aren't high interest rates supposed to be bad for long duration assets like NVIDIA? Uh, you know, clearly not so, so, so far. So yeah, I mean, I guess the question is, what have you made of the uh, resilience uh, strength in crypto prices as well as perhaps uh, stocks, given that the Fed's balance sheet continues to decline and that interest rates continue to uh, uh, go go higher, even though you know may maybe the Fed is done, and that's another question: Is the Fed done? You're in. <laughs> There's a lot of questions yeah, there. I know. Um, for the stock market, just to start there, you know, it's basically it's earnings and interest rates, right? Uh, valuation in the equity markets, the present value of future cash flow. So you got to figure out what the cash flows are, then you got to discount it with an interest rate, and obviously. Interest rates have been rising. That puts um, that's a headwind for valuation, but earnings look like they've bottomed in the second quarter and they're starting to recover. So, the market, the stock market, has rallied five PE points since nine months, since 11 months ago, since the low in October of last year. That's a pretty big rally on the basis of um, an expected soft landing. So, a lot of good news has been priced in there. Um, as for, you know, and I'll talk about, about Bitcoin because that's where I spend most of my time in crypto. You know, um, I think before the pandemic, uh, Bitcoin was basically all about the adoption curve and the adoption curve gets driven by, you know, the, the built-in scarcity, decentralization. Those are very big features that drive the adoption. But ultimately, it's a network asset. The value of the network is driven by the growth of, of, of the network. Uh, but in recent years, um, at least according to my work, um, you know, real rates, just like they do for gold, uh, and you, know, you mentioned gold, Mark, you know, real rates went from minus two to plus two over the last three years, uh, and that's a pretty good explanation for why gold has not been able to rally, even though the balance sheet you know, is significantly higher. But for Bitcoin, you can explain about 90% of the price action by looking at the growth of the network and, and real rates. Um, and uh, based on a band of, let's say, plus 2% real rates, which is where we are now based on the TIPS market, to minus 2, which is where we were a couple of years ago, the band is about 40 to 100,000 for Bitcoin and obviously moving up, up and to the right over time. And, um, and so the good news is that real rates, well, the bad news is that real rates are now positive that is a headwind that presumably, in my view, will slow the adoption curve. The good news is that real rates generally don't go much higher than where they are now. And the Fed is probably close to the end of its tightening cycle, which means that we can start looking towards the next cycle, which presumably would be an easing one. And that might then reaccelerate that adoption curve. Right, so... Uh, Jack, can I jump in? Because Urien said something I think is really important for people to, to really focus on. So he said that band is, is 40 to 100,000. Uh, for a fair value, and I'll put a finer uh, point on it. Um, Tim Peterson, who, if you don't follow, you should follow uh, at N Squared Crypto, has the best model uh, on Metcalf's Law for valuing the, the Bitcoin blockchain network. And it is simply a network, and it's very easy to value. And the fair value is determinable, unlike people saying it's not, and it has no value. No, it has value based on network. So that value today is in the low 50,000s, not 26, and his range is 40 to 100, which 53 is right in, you know, right in there. So if that's accurate, which I'm going to say you got, you know, one, two, and maybe Jim might even agree. So we'll have three is the charm. If that's accurate, then the current price is below fair value. Well, what does that mean? That's what happens at the end of bear markets as you begin the accumulation phase, and. And, and this is why you have a four-year cycle. So all the punters and speculators and gamblers and degenerates who bought on leverage, which why would you buy an 80 vol asset at 100 times leverage? You're an idiot. Uh, 
and, and it goes down, and everybody gets liquidated. And, and so you, you fall far below fair value, and then you eventually trough. And just like at 3,200 in December of, of 18, uh, was the very, very bottom fair value at the time was around 11,000, you'll eventually accrete back up through crypto spring and summer. We're in crypto summer today from June until June of next year. And you, you accrete back to fair value, but then the halving comes along. Well, the halving does something interesting in that it doubles the fair value. It's actually one of the most genius coding things ever in the history of coding in that it's a built-in mechanism for moving the price. And by moving the price, you attract interest because if things are moving, people are interested in them. Um, and since it's mostly guys in this room, right? Guys can't even see it if it's not moving. My wife says, get the ketchup, I open the door. Honey, there's no ketchup. She walks up, grabs the ketchup bottle. If it ain't moving, I can't see it. So that is true. And so once the price starts moving, after the halving starts and the block rewards go down, then the investors get crowded out by speculators. Investors buy assets below their fair value. That's anyone who's buying Bitcoin today. They are investors. When it gets to fair value, then the speculators come in. What are speculators? There's the opposite of hedgers. Hedgers are forced to sell. They produce the asset. They sell in the marketplace, usually in the futures market. And the speculators are just the opposite side of it. There's nothing wrong with speculator. The problem is the gamblers. The gamblers come in after when it's really moving, and they start buying with leverage. And that pushes us into crypto fall, into the parabolic where we get above fair value, so the last fair value uh, was around 30,000. We got all the way to 69, and then the crash happens. And, and so this is so the difference between again. a speculator and a gambler is just leverage? Leverage and knowledge. A yeah, speculator yeah, yeah. is taking the opposite side of a hedger because they know the hedger must sell. Okay? A gambler doesn't give a shit about any reason. They just know that something's moving and they want to take a piece of it. Yeah, so the point you make about the It's a trader on steroids. Volatility is interesting because uh, Bitcoin is historically very volatile, and you know, most other crypto is much more volatile, but crypto has ha Bitcoin has very, very low volatility uh, over the past uh, you know, six, six months compared to historical. Well, it has an annualized fall of 58, which is about four times the S&P, so. Yeah. yeah but compar compared to uh, what it used to be. Uh, like I'm, I'm, well, it's 80. To, it's, over 14 and a half years, it's 80. It's fallen to yeah. 58, and it's because it's being manipulated. The price of Bitcoin is being manipulated right this moment, every single freaking day, because you can sell a paper Bitcoin with no corresponding demand for physical in the futures market. And the longer they put off the ETF, the worse it gets. And it's intentional. That's the thing. It's, it's not like this is magic. This is real, and it's been happening in financial markets. Look at every commodity market in the history of mankind. When there is no futures market, the commodity has a nice cycle between buyers and sellers and producers and speculators. When the future is introduced, you get peaks and troughs, and you get massive financial engineering, and you get manipulation because it's very profitable, extremely profitable to manipulate prices using paper. Right? In the old days, if I wanted to sell you oil, Jack, I had to have a barrel of oil. Mm -hmm. Now, I can just make a promise that I'll go get a barrel from Jim here, and maybe he'll have some to give me. But hey, if I can't get it, we just settle up. Except in 2020, when they couldn't all settle up because the Saudis had come in and filled up all the storage, and bought up all the storage, they didn't actually fill it up, mm -hmm. they just bought it up, and the price went negative. Right, Remember yeah. oil price went negative? That was yeah. fucked up, right? That was unreal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That was. Oh, so I, I want to get Jim in here. So Urian's point about real rates, uh, that's inf inflation-adjusted uh, level of interest rates. Definitely, you know, Jim, you're, you're, you, live, you live in the world of, of real rates. And so negative rates were negative, uh, negative or real rates were at negative 2% when uh, inflation was at 2%, expected inflation at 2%, and interest rates were at zero, held by the Federal Reserve. Now interest rates are at 5.5%, and, and, you know, in expected inflation is at 3, 3.5%, so real rates are at 2%. So we from, as Urian said, negative 2% to 2%, and Urian said that's unfavorable for Bitcoin and crypto. What is your view on this, Jim? Well, first of all, I wanted to say I did learn something new that T-Rexes and Euroscos can't th see things that move. So that's a big deal right there uh, as well. But real rates, interest rates, the price of credit really is the basis of all macro. It's the basis where everything begins, money, credit. What does it cost you? And if it costs you more or if it costs you less, um, that really does kind of filter through and drive everything else, the economy, the 
uh, the financial markets, speculation. It's a lot different to speculate when you have positive real rates versus negative real rates uh, as well. Now, on the question of real rates, the problem with we, we have an, a real rate security that the Treasury issues, uh, uh, Treasury Inflation Protected Security, which tells you what the real rate is, but that only came about in the late 1990s. Um, what were real rates like in the 60s, 70s, and 80s? Well, we didn't have that security trading, but we could kind of estimate it, and they were way higher. They were in the 4, 5, 6 percent range for a decade. And that's why if you look at financial markets during that period of the 70s into the, <coughs> excuse me, into the early 80s, they were terrible. The markets were terrible. Not only did they not return you much of anything, but they were not even performing in line with inflation, and you were just losing money along the way. So I would say that interest rates, especially real rates, are definitely going to be a big driver. Now that I've said that, uh, a couple of other things I wanted to, to mention. They are having an impact on traditional markets. Uh, there are seven stocks in the S&P. Um, the Magnificent Seven, as they call them, whenever it gets a moniker to it, you could tell that we're at the eighth or ninth inning of that play as well, too. Um, you know, these are the NVIDIAs, the Apples, the Googles, uh, the Teslas, um, the Amazons of the world. They're two-thirds of the return in the market this year. If you take those companies out, and they're all being driven by two letters, AI, and the hope and promise of AI, the rest of the market's in mid-single-digit returns. If you look further down the down the, the, the stack to small cap stocks like the Russell 2000, which is company number 1,001 to 3,000 in terms of size, they're in the low single digits. If you look at the last 1,000 companies in the Russell 2000, so company number 2,000 to 3,000, they're down on the year. And one of the reasons that as you further get further away from the letters AI, it, those companies impacted, are impacted greater and greater by interest rates. And they're suffering, I think, more and more by interest rates. Now, I'm going to uh, diverge a little bit from here. Uh, I think that the Fed's not done. I think they're not only going to raise rates in November. I'm worried they're going to continue to raise rates into 24. I think that there is going to be a belief that there's a bigger inflation problem than we think we yeah. had in 30 seconds. The biggest economic event of our lifetime was the shutdown restart of the economy in 2020. It, you rebooted the economy, and it did, and I'm talking about the global economy, it did not come back in the same way as it was before. So you hear people, if you are stuck like us watching CNBC or Bloomberg all day, you hear people talking about normalization. That's code word for, we're going to go back to 2019. No, we're not. This is normal, what we're seeing right now. What 2019 was, you could send to the anthropology department and let them analyze it because we're not going back there anymore. And the biggest thing that tells you things are different is this whole work from home phenomenon or hybrid work phenomenon. Any given day, one third of the desks globally in offices are empty. People are working remotely now to a degree that we've never seen before. That's just one of many examples. So I fear that the inflation rate is going to stay higher. Interest rates are going to stay higher. It's not only going to be a drag on the TradFi markets, especially when you get away from the hype of AI, but it's going to be a drag on anything else that depends on the cost of credit, even down into the crypto line. Look, we all look at staking yields and we all look at liquidity uh, pools and the yields there too. They have to compete with that, like I said earlier. And if those rates are going to stay up, and if those rates continue higher, no, I could be wrong on that, but if they do, that puts an extra onus in order to get those markets to start moving even more. Yeah. Can I add one thing to what Please. Jim said? Um, despite the rise in interest rates and the rise in inflation, the term premium is still negative. And that's to your point about rates back a couple of decades ago. The fact that the term premium is minus 50 basis points on the 10-year treasury uh, Why don't you explain term premium? No, 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 no. <laughs> Serious? I, a, a term premium is what investors demand as compensations for owning long-term bonds. So it could be credit risk, inflation, interest rate risk, and and so investors are still paying the U.S. government for the for the for the privilege of buying their long-term paper. Normally, the term premium is positive. So if the term premium went to positive from where it is now, the 10-year treasury would be over 5%. And that would be uh, a further headwind for a lot of asset classes. Yeah, so I, I've heard the 
you know, term premium and looked into it probably 50 times, and I still understand it. So uh, it's, it's, it's a it's very... A, it's a concept. It's not an actual thing. Yeah. Yeah. But the Fed does try and put a number on it. Uh, yeah. oh, so, so uh, Jim, you said you think the Fed can raise more and short-term rates can go up, not only if the Fed does another 25 basis point hike or maybe even two, maybe even three, um, but if the Fed doesn't cut, interest rates will actually still go up and they stay them where they are because the market is pricing in cuts for, for 2024. So, uh, yeah, Urian, what are what's your view on uh, the concept that the Fed is going to keep interest rates higher for longer uh, and is, is that going to be headwind as well? Yeah, so the market has incorrectly predicted that the Fed would pivot um, for you know the last year plus, and of course since they moved off zero, they've been yeah. incorrectly yep. pivoting. Um, the th so the so uh, you know I think uh, I think the Fed is close to being done, um, but that doesn't mean it's going to cut rates. And you know the market can be forgiven uh, for assuming this because generally the Fed is either hiking or cutting. It rarely just sits there and does nothing. I mean, sometimes it does. And in 94, Greenspan gave back a few of the rate hikes because he achieved a very rare coveted soft landing. Uh, but that's the exception rather than the rule. So generally, when the Fed stops cutting, it almost immediately starts, uh, sorry, when the Fed stops hiking, it almost immediately starts cutting. And I think that's what the market is kind of, you know, putting into its models. But my, my sense, you know, core PCE is at over 4%. I mean, it's not even close to the Fed's target, even though the CPI is down to 3 So my sense is that the Fed will stay higher for longer. Maybe it doesn't go higher than where it is now, but it's certainly not going to give the market that kind of soft landing vibe that it, it's looking for. And the price of oil is up, what, 20 25 bucks from a few months ago, Jim. Not good for inflation. No, it's not. You know, the price of energy, and you could start with crude oil, is basically... Uh, the biggest driver of, in, of inflation, not only just obviously, you know, headline inflation, but that cost of that input cost of energy will eventually filter through into everything else, which we refer to as core inflation. Um, the price of crude oil is up. Uh, it is we're in a we're in a bad place when it comes to crude oil prices right now. The uh, administration um, drained the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, or the Strategic Midterm Reserve, it was called last year, and it worked. It kept gas prices down. They can't they can't drain it again because they've already drained it once. And now the Saudis kind of see that they've got them by the short hairs, and they announced again this morning that uh, they're going to have a voluntary three million barrel cut for the next several months. Price of crude oil is up another 3% today. Last time I looked, it's up 31% in about 10 weeks. Price of gasoline is going to start moving up, and that's going to filter through into everything else. Because when you ask the American public, what's your opinion about inflation, they're basically telling you what they see at the gas pump, because that's their basic driver of inflation. So if that keeps going up, it will make it, if nothing else, the Fed could... And people could stammer around and go, well, that's just oil. It's not the rest of inflation. And that could be 100% true, but they're not going to cut rates. They're not going to cut rates if the price of oil is up. They may, they, I could still be wrong, they may stop raising them, but they cannot then say, never mind about that $4.50 national average on gas prices. It's about three eighty now. Ignore that. We'll cut rates because of, uh, you know, that's something else. That will be a big factor as we go forward. And the Saudis have definitely got the, you know, they've got it going now. Not only do they want to, you know, get rid of the reserve currency, they want to they get the price of crude oil up. And everybody's got an agenda, and the Saudis' agenda has already been stated in the last 10 days or so. Aramco, which is the uh, Saudis' uh, state oil company, wants to sell another $50 billion dollars of uh, shares in their company. They want investors to pony up $50 billion for their shares. Well, the Saudis also want to be out of the oil business by 2030. So how are you going to get investors to buy your, your shares? You've got to ramp the price of crude oil up. And they're doing a pretty good job of it right now. And they'll get global fund managers all excited, and they'll be buying their shares pretty soon. I just think it's quaint <clears throat> that you all think that, that the government uh, is here to help, so to speak. Um, interest rates are rising not because of inflation. There's no inflation. Inflation is caused when there's excess demand and limited supply of a good or service. What we have is currency devaluation. When an empire ends, uh, the reason it ends is because you, you consolidate the, the uh, power at the top with your cronies, and you go on a spender, on a, on a binger, and you spend a lot, and you don't have any money, 
So in the old days, you would go out and conquer other nations, and you'd take their stuff to pay for it. We can't do that anymore. It's frowned upon. Um, and so what do you do? You just issue debt, and you stuff it everywhere. Uh, we stuffed it in the banks. Like literally, the banks were required to buy treasuries. Well, that was not a problem as long as interest rates were low. In fact, it was free money. J.P. Morgan had zero negative trading days for three years. Zero. Did anyone ever trade with zero negative trading days? If you talk to me, DM me. You we'll, mean, we'll go business to together. be clear what he means by zero negative trading days is every single day for a year, they made money trading. Every day. Are you 252 for 252 in your trading? No there's one. 252 no trading one. days in a year. And so, JP Morgan is. Yeah, JP Morgan. They're, is it they're because good. they're good? Yeah. Or do they have some help there? Well, no, it, it, was, it was a guaranteed trade, right? Because anyone here ever borrow at Fed funds? Nope. Nope. No one does, right? Who borrowed at Fed funds? The banks. So when Fed funds were zero, the banks would borrow at zero, and they would invest in treasuries at two and a half, three percent Riskless trade, levered up 11 times. Awesome. Awesome. Why do they do that? Because the banking system was bankrupt after the gold financial crisis, so you had to reliquify the banks. So you reliquify the banks by holding interest rates at emergency levels, even though there was no emergency. And then what happens? Well, then the bank's balance sheet gets fixed. Well, now they want to make some money. We can't make any money if interest rates are zero. So we're going to raise interest rates. And so anyone's deposit rate go up from zero? Mm, it's funny how that works. So they're still paying you zero on your deposits, and now they're lending, well, to anyone who will borrow, but there's no demand. But, but the few people that are borrowing that need to borrow are paying six, seven, eight percent. So NIMS have exploded, and bank profits are up. And banks, up until two weeks ago, were up 30 plus percent this year. Now they've rolled over because people are kind of seeing what's happening, which is overall liquidity is actually contracting because best laid plans are you get everybody psyched about low interest rates and you get the economy back coming, you lie about the recession. There was a recession in 2022, full stop. 0.9% year over year growth is a recession, full stop in history, that, that is a recession. We didn't call it a recession because we lied about the, the jobs number. By the way, anyone check this out? Every month this year, every single month, the NFP has been revised down. Yeah, Every not single month. Rolls. Yeah, but for 335,000 mythical jobs that people think were created that actually weren't created. Because no one looks at adjustments. No one looks at restatements. Right, but, and Jim, Jim and Yuri know this, but were like 18 months in a row where it was the opposite, where they were constantly revised up. So there were jobs that weren't being accounted for, and now they're- Because they use this thing called the birth-death ratio, which is the- fucking stupidest thing <laughs> on the planet. It's we live in a stupid. world where no, it is stupid. It's not stupid. We live in a world where we know exactly how many people go to work, we know exactly how much they pay and how much they get paid and how much they pay in taxes. We know exactly to the to the minute and yet we use this formula that says, oh, we're 17 months into an expansion, so this many companies should have been formed, and this many companies should have gone yeah. bankrupt, and therefore this many companies would hire, and this many companies would fire, and therefore we have a birth and death, and we create a number. Uh, a third of the workforce. But that assumes we're still in expansion. Well, right. if we were, had to say we're in a recession in 2020, which we were, then that ratio would be different. So that million jobs, which doesn't exist, that's been made up, literally grabbed out of the air, and that Biden takes credit for. No, just. <laughs> anyway. but, but, okay, so re recession point, uh, for, first of all, I was say about the banking no, system. No, but my point is yeah, yeah. that the banking system got their balance sheet fixed. Now they want to make money. So they are loving this. They don't have to pay you anything for deposits. But they are. They are. They are? They, they are the NIMS are going down now. Net interest margins because yeah. deposit costs are going, going up. What you said is totally, totally accurate up until maybe six months ago. And, uh, yeah, bank, bank profitability is... Is, is going to be down, uh, I think. And I think when they report in a, in a month or two. Except J.P. Morgan, because everybody, yeah. you know, there's, there's, there's two yeah. levels of banks in this country. There's J.P. Morgan and various levels of suck is yeah. the banking system uh, at this point. And everybody will hide all of their money in J.P. Morgan and, and happily get zero interest rates because they figured that, you know, when the cockroaches take over, I could go to a Chase branch and get my money back. Who bought, who bought Washington Mutual? Uh, J.P. Morgan. And, and who bought Silicon Valley Bank? J.P. Morgan. Hmm, okay. 
Yeah. First, they bought First Republic. Yeah. But the rest of the yeah. banks have to give you an interest rate. And if they don't give you an interest rate, um, then they become like Citibank. If you've seen poor Citibank, it's on its way back to a dollar a share again after a 50 to 1 reverse split. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and no, that's 100 to 1. It was, uh, well, it was 100 to 1. Yeah. Well, it was 50 under 2. Remember so. that Citibank and its predecessor, for the last 150 years, every time we've had a financial crisis in this country, that bank fails and then gets bailed out. So it's not a real financial crisis till Citibank fails. So just keep yeah. that in mind. And uh, one issue with the banking system we, we didn't talk about is just how they bought all these long-term loans, that long-term securities that are now worth much less because the phase, Fed raised rates. But uh, uh, Mark, interesting point about a recession. I, I know we only got a, a few minutes left. So yeah, what, what do you, the three of you think about the business cycle uh, going forward? No, we're the government. We can just extend the duration of the, ex the session. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, we just pretend we don't have an end. <laughs> you, you, you know, you know, uh, Jack. I'm usually considered the voice of reason in these rooms, but I'm actually starting to believe all the conspiracy theories now. That, that <laughs> it's only a conspiracy that, that if Mark it isn't is so true. eloquently uh, uh, passing on here. Well, it's only a conspiracy if it isn't true. Truth is an absolute defense. I learned that. Um, my, my sense on the recession is that obviously it will happen someday. Uh, there are l legitimate mitigating circumstances why the yield curve has so far not uh, come to fruition, uh, even though it's been inverted for a long time. One is that almost all homeowners refinanced their mortgage in 2020 and 21, uh, went from floating to fixed and locked in a 3% rate, and unless they have to move, they're pretty much immune to the Fed's rate hikes. Corporates did the same thing. Their wall of maturity is starting to come closer, but it's not there yet. Um, as you said, J.P. Morgan is still funding itself mostly at zero or 0 0.5 percent, even though it's passing along the higher interest rate costs to its customers. Uh, so banks are remaining fairly profitable, at least the big ones are, maybe not the small ones. And so I think that's kind of um, uh, pushing out the, the due date of the recession signal. Yeah, and just, just for background, uh say 11 months ago, Bloomberg, you know, very blue chip TradFi firm, had a recession probability of 99%. It was utterly mainstream that we would be in a recession, a deep one by now. And the U.S. economy has been resilient and, uh, you know, credit being, is being paid off. And that's the, that's the background. Jim? So we had negative GDP growth in Q1 and Q2 of 2022. Because inflation was so high, yeah. No, yeah. Nom we had, we had no, negative GDP was growth. High. And yeah. the only reason we had positive GDP growth in third quarter and fourth quarter is because they drained the SPR and counted the oil twice. I agree with you on that. Yeah. yeah. So th th to, to say we didn't have a recession, it's just silly, but that's what they're going to say. And now we're in the beginning part of a recovery. We're not in you know, a 12-year expansion, but we're treating economic data as if we're in the 12th year of an expansion, which just doesn't make any sense. I'm with Mark. I think the recession was last year. And I think that, you know, just because the Business Cycle Dating Committee didn't call it a recession. In fact, it's the only time in American history that we've had two negative quarters in a row that wasn't a recession. So we possibly, you could make a case that we had it last year. Um, that doesn't mean that we're in the wood, uh, out of the woods. Right. That doesn't right. mean, oh, good, it was right. last year, so we've got another four years of runway in front of us before the next recession. There could be one. I'm of the opinion, though, that the strength in the economy um, as we go forward is going to be a lot of nominal strength in the economy. That means with inflation added in there, and that that is going to keep us from seeing negative numbers as we go forward. That's not necessarily bullish because it's going to keep interest rates up. That's going to keep that competition that interest rates provide all the other investments high, and all the other investments are going to have to jump over that hurdle rate. Well, Seven companies can get everybody whipped up with two letters, AI, but the rest of the economy and the rest of everybody else is going to really struggle with that competition. Um, University of Chicago has done a long-term study that says that over long periods of time, the stock market should return 9%. Now, over the last two years, it's returned zero. Just to give you an idea, it was down big last year, up big this year. Um, a money market fund, a, a, a three-month treasury bill, is giving you two-thirds of that, five and a half, with no risk, no risk at all. You get mm -hmm. two-thirds of what you're supposed to get over a long period of time in the stock market through a money market fund. Um, if that starts creeping towards six, then you know it, it's going to start to impact all investments. So I'm not in the recession camp because of the higher nominal growth, 
but I don't necessarily see that as being, oh, all good, because that competition of risk-free interest rates is going to remain a problem. And if we don't have that recession, I don't see the Fed cutting rates next year as much as the consensus has been seeing it uh, for cutting rates. But nominal is just a myth. It's, it's money illusion, right? Best performing stock market in 2006 was Zimbabwe, right? One because of the best ever. Currencies. It was up like a million percent. Yeah, but and, and you had starving million. billionaires, and I have 100 trillion right. Zimbabwe dollar bill that wouldn't buy a loaf of bread. Best performing stock market last three years was Venezuela. Anyone buy Venezuelan stocks? No. So when you have a high performing stock market, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing. And people look at the nominal value, and that's the problem is they're, they're conditioned by nom that you've been sold a bill of goods since you were born that inflation is good. On what planet is something that steals half your wealth for your purchasing power over a 30-year period good? On no planet would that be good. So that's theft, literally theft. And the higher that rate is, the more theft. And if you look at, we're quote unquote near all-time highs in stocks, right? Yes. Only because you denominate it in toilet paper. If you denominate in gold, we're dead flat since 1997. Dead flat since 1997. If you denominate in Bitcoin, it's fucked up. <laughs> I mean, it's bad. <laughs> and so, and I'm not saying Bitcoin is, because the first four years of Bitcoin don't count because it was too sciencey and not, not liquid enough. The last 10 years count. And here's something to just- Yeah, so, sorry, sorry, I, I, I gotta end this. Uh, we, it's a real quick final question, and the answer is gonna be one word. Is uh, macro over the next, let's say, 12 months a headwind, tailwind, or doesn't matter for, for crypto? Uh, Urian, Jim, and then Mark. Headwind. Headwind, higher rates. Doesn't matter. Right. Having, baby. We'll leave Having. it there. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for listening. <laughs>